So thank you. Um, I first want to just say it's a real honor to be here today. I'm not able to be here the entire time, and I'm frustrated by that, especially after hearing the talk that we just heard and the impact from those of you in the room and, of course, from Gaetano's legacy. Um, before I actually talk about human work banking, which is the topic today, um, I want to talk a little bit about our partnership with the University of Washington, with Gaetano, and some of the other um, things that we've learned along the way. Uh, I represent PATH, which is a global health nonprofit based right here in Seattle. Um, there are many here in the audience, I think, who we've worked with in the past, and we're in uh, much gratitude, I think, uh, too. But I, I want to go back a little bit. Um, we started working, I think, with you, Deb, maybe in 2010, 2011, and I, I think my first thoughts were, how is this going to be useful? These are computer scientists, we're public health, we know what we're doing. And I think that, to our detriment, is the detriment and the issue with public health today. I think often it's too siloed. We don't know what we don't know until we're with others from other fields who see things from a different perspective. And so I was quickly humbled <laughs> in the field with several of you here. Um, and again, I think it's because you came bearing the vision from Gaetano um, that really, you know, working with people like Carl on the Mobile Midwest Project in India, with Trevor and Richard on our projecting health, and with Rohit um, on our human milk banking project that I'll go into more detail. I think I quickly saw these aren't computer scientists, these are people who actually see the world differently from public health practitioners. Um, and I think this reflects Caetano's vision around open access, around trying to be optimistic, and instead of seeing a problem, seeing a solution. And I see too often in my public health colleagues, we're trained to see a problem. And we identify what's wrong, but we don't always know how to fix it. And we need to step outside of our bounds and to go to those who maybe have different expertise. And um, I think together, the field of computer science and public health, we could do much as was just reflected by the talk that I think is um, very powerful. So I want to say thank you um, for all of the past, and I, I'll go into more detail now about this particular uh, project that has been quite exciting over the years. Um, I would imagine many of you are wondering, what is a human milk bank, which we will get into in a moment. Um, but first of all, I'll talk about why. Uh, PATH works in, uh, across the spectrum on maternal and child health issues, but a particular interest is neonatal mortality. Um, that's defined as death within the first four weeks of life. Um, and that really is the burden worldwide. 15 million uh, babies are born preterm every year. A million deaths are really from preterm uh, birth complications. And the majority of these deaths happen in developing countries where they don't have access to the usual care that we would have here. Um, one thing that we have been focused on for many years in public health is breastfeeding. Uh, the data is behind um, the fact that provision of breast milk, human milk to these babies is powerful. And in fact, uh, publications in the Lancet um, where they have analyzed all of the interventions for improving neonatal morbidity and mortality, breastfeeding was found to be the single greatest intervention in terms of saving newborn lives. Um, so PATH is very active in this front with counseling and training programs. But again, it's about thinking outside the box. How can we expand what we do to actually um, increase access to this intervention that's been shown to be so powerful. But the problem comes when if uh, we're talking about a baby who is in a neonate intensive care unit, let's say, um, and the mother has died, or the baby's been abandoned, or the mother just had surgery and isn't available to breastfeed. Um, this is a very critical time for those babies, and yet they don't have access to mother's own milk. Um, when that is the case, and this is often the case for preterm babies, low birth weight babies, the ones who are most vulnerable, the WHO has provided a hierarchy of how they are to be fed. Um, of course, mother's own milk is first, uh, and then donated fresh preterm milk, meaning milk from another mother who has a, a preterm baby, um, or just other donor milk from a mother who has uh, even an older baby. So in the absence of mother's own milk, it's donor human milk that is uh, the next most appropriate option. And the only way that is accessible and safe is through something called a human milk bank. 
So if you haven't heard of that before, don't worry. There are many people in this field who have never heard of it. Um, but you can liken it to uh, a blood bank. Um, it's a facility where um, the donor milk is collected, mothers are screened, uh, and the milk is then stored safely and pasteurized to uh, kill any potential pathogens, and then stored safely again until it's distributed. Um, and usually it's prescribed by a neonatologist as like a medication. And this is very important because what has been shown for these particular infants who are very vulnerable um, is that provision of human milk compared to formula is quite powerful. There is um, something called necrotizing enterocolitis that uh, preterms are specifically uh, at risk of getting, and that's basically where the gut dies. Can you imagine having to do surgery on these preterm babies who are less than 1.5 kgs? Um, and the gut is just never the same. They have lifelong um, complications. So when these babies are given human milk instead of formula, uh, Cochrane review found that um, incidence of this neck can be reduced by up to 80%. So clearly provision of human milk is an intervention that public health um, practitioners need to be paying attention to. The WHO knows that they have put out a call globally that human milk banks should be established all over the world. But here's the problem. These newborns are dying um, in numbers that are so great in areas like India, Africa, um, of course here in the US and in developed countries, but that's not where the heaviest burden is. And yet if you look where human milk banks are, this doesn't show the scope and the numbers behind each of these dots, but Europe, Brazil, the US, they have a, a fair number of human milk banks. But in India and in Africa, no, they're just not there. And so we have a, a major disconnect here. We have a WHO recommendation for what can save these babies' lives, and yet the intervention is just not present. And that leads me to our project and our connection with the University of Washington. So PATH started looking into this several years ago, realizing, wait a second, why is, you know, what, why is there a gap with human milk banks? Something really needs to be done. Um, and we quickly realized one of the barriers was around technologies. Um, recall I said that to make the milk safe, uh, there's a system around pasteurization, it's heating the milk. Um, that is not an easy process. You have to make sure you don't underheat it or overheat it. Um, and so you need a pretty complicated heating mechanism. But the pasteurizing unit that is shown here, the larger one, can be really expensive, over $100,000 um, sometimes if you purchase a larger unit. And many uh, hospitals, even if your neonatologist wants to establish a milk bank, they simply can't afford it. Um, so we started looking at this and thinking, well, wait a second, why is this so complicated? This is a heating mechanism. It surely isn't that difficult. And what we found was that really to date, no groups of engineers, no public health groups had looked at how to simplify the system, make it low cost and more accessible. So together with Rohit Chowdhury, which I don't know where he went, <laughs> Um, we, uh, we met with Gaetano and um, the group and realized they had been working on a device that was um, using ODK temperature sensing systems um, for vaccine cold chain to monitor in real time vaccine cold chain temperatures. And we thought, huh, this is something that might be able to be used for simplified pasteurization technologies. What you see on the bottom is uh, basically a water bath. That's donor human milk. And what we, what we found out is in some of the intensive care units in South Africa, they were doing that. They just had a jar of milk in a water bath and heating it. There was no way to monitor the temperature, no way to track it, no real mechanism for quality control, which was pretty disturbing. And when we uh, learned about the Phonastra, uh, system that was being used for vaccines, we talked with Gaetano's team and realized that that could be pretty easily adapted to monitor pasteurization. And so that's what we did. We worked together with Gaetano's team and with Rohit to adapt uh, the Phone Astra technology um, and we were able to pilot this in South Africa in a number of facilities, um, having significant user feedback and adapting the device over time. Um, and here is our team in one of the milk banks in South Africa. But I think what I'd like to do is show you a video. This was made by the Human Milk Banking Association of South Africa um, that will tell you a little bit more about how the, um, the system works and how they are implementing it now. So let's hope the video will work.
Pure human milk is needed for infants who do not have access to their own mother's milk. Human milk banks are set up to collect and process donor human milk. Current milk banking standards require the pasteurization of donor human milk to ensure that all pathogens, like HIV, are killed off prior to feeding it to vulnerable infants. To simplify the pasteurization process, a mobile app was created to monitor the temperature of the pasteurization process and give real-time instructional guidance for the proper pasteurization of donor human milk. This entire system is called Foam Astra. In this system, a temperature probe is placed in a glass bottle and is connected to the Phone Astra base, which interacts with the mobile app to read the temperature. The app guides users through the pasteurization process based on these readings. Three glass bottles are filled with 120 milliliters of donor human milk. In addition, the bottle with the temperature probe is filled with 120 milliliters of water. The user first enters the donor's information into the cell phone. This includes a donor ID, the type of milk, which could be term or preterm, the date that the milk was expressed by the donor mother, and how much milk is in the bottle. Once this is done, the labels are printed by a Bluetooth-enabled printer and placed on the corresponding bottles. The bottles are then placed in a stand. The stand is placed in a pot of water, which is placed on an induction stove. To begin the pasteurization process, the user clicks Submit on the phone screen of the app. They turn the stove on and then click the Start button on the mobile app. This establishes a Bluetooth connection between the phone and the Phone Astra base. The phone now displays temperatures received from the temperature probe, which corresponds to instructions at each step of the process. Just before the temperature gets too high, the app beeps to alert the user that it is getting close to being done. When the target temperature for pasteurization is reached, the app on the phone beeps continuously, prompting the user to move the stand to a cool water basin. After a short while, the app beeps again and prompts the user to add ice packs. The procedure is complete when the app detects that the temperature has sufficiently cooled down. The user can then print a pasteurization log using the Bluetooth-enabled printer. The mobile app also uploads the temperature data to a server for review by supervisors. Supervisors can remotely access the server using an internet browser. The main page shows a summary of all the milk banks. Clicking on a milk bank displays a page that lists all the procedures performed at the facility. Clicking on a procedure brings up a page that displays a temperature curve and summary data for that procedure. Phone Astra was designed to help vulnerable infants since they can't save themselves. Providing pasteurized donor human milk to a baby may save their life if they do not have access to their own mother's milk. We would like to thank all those involved in the making of Phone Astra for use in human milk banking. So, clearly I think you can see that even with um, just a simple system and adapting something that was already being used elsewhere, we were able to significantly improve the quality control of this Phonastra, um, using the Phonastra enabled pasteurization system. And the feedback that we've received from South Africa has been significant. Um, we have interest in this device around the world now because people see the value in using something like this either for small scale human milk banks or maybe if you're a hospital establishing a human milk bank for the first time and you just need something small while you scale up and save money before you can buy the larger pasteurizer. Um, nothing like this exists anywhere else. 
currently. So right now we are in our phase two um, project really in South Africa. We received a grand challenge um, for this from the Gates Foundation and right now we're operationalizing an integrated model for human milk banking that is enabled really by this phone astra system allowing us to have human milk banks in smaller tiered facilities um, which was definitely the goal for the Department of Health as well. They already had milk bank programs going on in the country and in the region but not really to this extent. So we're quite pleased with uh, um, uh, the position, I think, for where this, this uh, device is right now. We're trying to work with a local manufacturer um, to make this more widely accessible globally. The South African Medical Research Council is interested in helping us take this to the next step. And I would certainly like to acknowledge um, everyone who's been involved in this, but most importantly, it is the University of Washington and Gaetano's vision, I think, in passing on um, his uh, public health view to all of his students that we so greatly appreciate. And I would encourage, I, I think, given the, the group that comes to this kind of conference, you're already, I think, looking this way. But, you know, I just came from the European Milk Banking Association meeting in um, Europe. And who's missing in those meetings are the engineers. You know, again, we know what the problems are, we don't know how to fix it. So they talk about the same things over and over again, year after year. And that just has to change. So I'm just grateful to be a part of this and see these minds kind of working together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten, that this was a great talk. And you know, in terms of collaborations, both in terms of top, topic domain and people involved, this I feel this is just one of the most remarkable collaborations I've seen for you know, spanning the distance between human milk banking and an academic computer science program. That our next talk, Roy Want, is going to speak. Roy is a research scientist at Google, and Roy has had a long-term career interdependence with Gaetano.